Our guest today is Alexander Wang. If you look him up online, you'll immediately learn that Alexander became the youngest self-made billionaire in May 22. You'll also find headlines, he's the next Elon Musk. When you meet him in person, you'll quickly learn he's one of the most passionate AI visionaries and entrepreneurs working really hard to help realize the benefits of artificial intelligence. Alexander is founder and CEO of Scale AI, which he founded in 2016, back when he was only 19 years old. In fact, he dropped out of MIT to found the company. Scale AI is now a seven plus billion dollar company. AI capabilities are driven by data. In fact, ultimately, most often, AI capabilities are bottlenecked by data. Scale AI resolves this bottleneck by helping you get your data labeled and more generally helps ensure the data you use to train your AI systems is of the highest possible quality. Scale also enables leveraging foundation models, that is, very large pre trained models, and then train or really fine tune your own models with your own data on top of these foundation models. Scale's customers include Microsoft, Etsy, Flexboard, GM, Instacart, SAP, Square, Toyota, OpenAI, Adept, Cohere, Stability, and the list goes on and on. And in fact, not only companies, but also the US Air Force, US Army, are customers of Scale AI. Alex, so great to have you here with us. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. That was a very, uh, a very nice intro. Thanks so much. Well, you've done so much. <laughs> it's easy to make a very nice intro for you. I'm so impressed always when I see what you've been up to whenever we catch up. Now, Alex, before diving into today's conversation, I'd like to thank our podcast sponsors, Index Ventures and Weights and Biases. Index Ventures is a venture capital firm that invests in exceptional entrepreneurs across all stages, from seed to IPO. With offices in San Francisco, New York, and London, the firm backs founders across a variety of verticals, including artificial intelligence, SaaS, fintech, security, gaming, and consumer. On a personal note, Index is an investor in Covariant, and I couldn't recommend them any higher. And in fact, Alex, I think Index is also an investor in Scale. Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, Mike Wolby, who I think is a board member of both of our companies, has been a uh has been a staunch supporter of ours and Index Ventures has been uh, an incredible supporter of all of our success since we were, uh, I think when they invested, we were about 20 people to now about 600 people. So um, I really couldn't say enough kind words about them and their support. I couldn't agree anymore. Um, in fact, <laughs> part of why we're so excited to bring them on board is because recommendations we got from, from you to bring them on board. So um our other sponsor, Weights and Biases, is an ML ops platform that helps you train better models faster with experiment tracking, model and data set versioning, and model management. They're used by OpenAI, NVIDIA, and almost every lab releasing a large model. In fact, many, if not all of my students at Berkeley and colleagues at Covariant are big users of Weights and Biases. Now, Alex, let's dive right in. Scale has the mission to accelerate the development of artificial intelligence and is doing so by providing a data-centric end-to-end solution to manage the entire machine learning life cycle. That's a lot. Could you unpack that for me? Yeah, so um, so we, we've been working on this kind of, as you mentioned, uh, started the company in 2016. So we've been in the AI game for some time now um, and uh, and you obviously have as well. So when we got started, we really, we really got our start was in helping companies build really high quality data sets. And so the, the, you know, our business has two parts. The first part is what we call scale data, which is again, all around helping companies and firms get the highest quality possible data for their, for their algorithms. And this is, this has sort of changed over the years, you know, in the early days, maybe it was a lot more on images. Um, then it moved to a lot more around video and now it's sort of changed to be a lot more around language as the sort of like, um, as the major data types have changed over time. But that's where we work with, you know, innovators like OpenAI and Meta and Microsoft and, um, and a lot of the, the largest labs in the world. Then 
we have a second part of our business called Scale Applied AI, which are basically a, a suite of AI models and products that can be applied to specific business use cases across, you know, uh, any industry or across industries that we that we build these solutions for. So this includes um, like we work a lot with, uh, as you mentioned, the Army and the Air Force on defense and intelligence problems. That's one big part of our business. We also work with large e-commerce companies, um, companies like Instacart or Grab in Southeast Asia um, to help them use better AI for better recommendations and search. We also work with uh, large insurance companies and the list kind of goes on and on. But that's where we go to companies that don't necessarily have AI teams or do have AI teams, but sort of have a long laundry list of business use cases. And we go and we build, um, or we have these AI models that we can deploy to them that will immediately drive business value. So these sort of two halves of the world for us are really how we try to serve, you know, really every business out there, whether you're an innovator that's trying to build the most cutting edge, um, most highly performing models, or you're somebody who really wants to leverage the benefits of artificial intelligence. Now, I think what you're describing there also highlights a very interesting trend in that in the early days, back 2016, when you started, very few people were building AI models to, to do something with. And it was specialists building in, but there were specialists in neural net design and so forth, not in, in labeling and collecting data and so forth. And that's where you saw an opportunity to really help everyone with their efforts. But these days, almost Every company everywhere uses AI. Not everybody wants to run their own in-house operation. And that seems where your second push at scale comes in, where you provide the full service. Um, I'm really curious when you think back. I mean, originally you were not doing that. You were just focused on data quality, data annotation. W what was the moment where you decided, actually, that's not enough. That's not going to be enough to do the things we want to do and help people build AI that they want to build. You know, as when we were in this sort of very focused on scale data, very focused on data annotation, data labeling, et cetera, um, it, was, uh, it, was an, it was a great place to focus because as you mentioned, you know, one of the things that we, we pride ourselves on at scale is that we're always willing to do this sort of like dirty jobs that maybe other people aren't as willing to do. And so, you know, in, in AI was back in 2016, what that was all around data, you know, data was like the, the sort of like ugly work and then maybe the glamorous work was uh, getting the neural network and training the neural network and then ultimately applying that neural network. Um, but one of the, the limitations that we found pretty quickly, like you mentioned, was that the, the number of, of sort of companies that had the resources and human capital and, and sort of, um, and, and, ca and actual capital, you know, cash to be able to meaningfully build their own algorithms and actually have a play at building the best in class algorithms was a really small list. And so as a business, you know, what we did is we, we went out to all those companies, you know, there were, there were a few hundred of them. We went to all these companies. Uh, we, we did our best in sort of showing them the, the quality of our products and the quality of our solutions. Um, a lot of them got really excited. And as more, more and more of them got excited and as it got captured more and more of that market, we realized, Hey, you know, this is, this is great. And we're having, a, we're definitely having a big impact on the AI industry. But if you looked, you know, this is probably 2019, 2020, when we were sort of having this sort of like realization. Um, if you look at the entire uh, economy, or you look at like, you know, every company out there, or every organization out there, we're only going to address such a small chunk of that overall market if we stay focused on these innovators who have the human capital and the resources to be able to build their own cutting edge models that we need to, we needed to figure out how do we serve you know, in service of the mission, how do we serve the rest of the sort of the rest of the world? And that's really what sort of motivated um, the the applied AI vision. And it was something that like, you know, in the early days, that's something we would always talk to our investors about. And we would talk about how like, hey, this is something that we could do over time if we are so lucky to be successful in the first business. And uh, and it was a great, you know, sort of with great fortune, we, we were able to start um, start making that a reality. Yeah, it's really impressive the trajectory the company has has been on. And going back to the, to the very early days, and, and I want to make, make our way from there. At 19, you dropped out of MIT to start the company. Um, that must have been a big decision. What did you see in, in labeling as, at that time, the starting point as being so promising that this was worth uh, dropping out? So there was sort of... Um... 
you know, there's kind of like a personal story here. So I was, I was studying AI and machine learning at MIT, and this was um, the year when uh, Google came out with TensorFlow, um, you know, DeepMind released AlphaGo. It was maybe the first, um, you know, you, you probably actually remember there are multiple ways, but it was one of the very early sort of like deep learning hype waves. And, um, and I remember that, so TensorFlow came out and I wanted to use it. Um, and so uh, I wanted to build like a, a uh, camera inside my fridge that would tell me when my roommates were stealing my food. And <laughs> part of that is like a, you know, an image recognition model that would tell you <laughs> what the foods were and would sort of like help recognize when there was sort of like a, a disturbance in the force, uh, so to speak. And, um, and all I did, you know, I needed to train like, a, like an object recognition model um, for that. And I remember pretty vividly, like, all I did was like, I took, um, I took like the, uh, like one of the, uh, examples, like one of the tutorials that Google had released with the, with TensorFlow. And then, um, I just swapped out like a bunch of constants. So like the number of classes and the, the sort of like size of the images and all that stuff. And then I had to go and spend all this effort in collecting a data set, um, so I had to collect a data set of like different conversions of food, different foods in there, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then like painstakingly had to go and figure out how to get them labeled. Um, at that time, I was mostly just hand labeling them because it was sort of like everything else was just too much of a pain in the ass. And um, I was a college student, so I didn't have that much money to <laughs> spend on other things. And then, um, and then, and then uh, lo and behold, you know, after labeling t like tens of thousands of images, I started to get something that like kind of sort of you could, you know, you could see like kind of worked. And um, I kind of had this, and then again, the rest of the code was all the same, you know, and I sort of had this realization that, um, in the, in sort of like this deep learning era, the code stays mostly fixed. And the thing that varies from application to application is actually, is actually data or, or put another way, the, the sort of like the data is what actually sort of quote unquote did the programming of, of the algorithm itself. Um, and that felt like a sort of like one of these profound, but, and sort of like you know, almost like pretty realizations. And then you sort of like think about that a little bit more deeply and it's like, oh, wow, that means that there, there probably should be companies focused on helping people build great data sets because that's what, you know, again, if you think about the variation or the, the sort of like competitive um, plane of most companies, that's going to be um, around data, data and data sets. And so that's going to be like a key piece, of, key piece of infrastructure. And, you know, I probably didn't, I couldn't articulate all of that in those terms at the time. Um, but that's sort of like roughly the sort of like train of thought that led me to, uh, to start the company to focus on data. And I remember like for a long time, it was sort of like, um, a lot of people ask questions, uh, around like, Hey, is this actually like that interesting of a business or is that actually that interesting of a place to, to focus? Most of people in machine learning could recognize that it was an important problem, um, and, and it needed to be solved. But then there were still all these questions around, Hey, is that actually like a, you know, is that, is that a cool business? And I would say for us, it's never been a cool business, um, or or at least like uh, as compared to like a lot of the other businesses you could start. But I think that that's that's been one of our sort of like uh, cultural traits or one of our advantages is that we we've never been too focused on being the the cool kids, but we've been more focused on being the useful the useful people. I remember in the early days when scale was started, I was thinking, okay, we we as a community would in the past ship data for labeling let's say to Amazon Mechanical Turk. And as scale came about, it was more specialized. So people working at scale doing labeling are more trained and ready to do labeling and the software is more specialized to, to support it. But I remember also thinking, like how defensible is this really going to be? Is this something that you know, can keep standing on its own as a business or will there be you know, so many parallel efforts and just in some sense a, a race to the bottom rather than an actual business. But you, you know, you've proven that this is a real business. I'm curious when you think about back then, how you thought about defensibility and looking back, what do you think makes scale sticky and people come back to it and won't go to somebody else who might have a slightly lower price, but then maybe can't offer everything you're offering? Yeah. So I think the first piece is, um, competition is kind of a reality of business is maybe the, like, <laughs> one of my macro realizations, um, over the, you know, at, since running the business. And, um, you should even see this now with, with Google, you know, we've sort of like lauded Google and search for, you know, 
decades for being this such a defensible business. And then now um, with uh, with Bing and Bing Chat and whatnot, the sort of like um, the threat, which we'll see obviously if it comes, if it sort of happens is like, hey, we're going to have Bing Chat and we're going to price our ads way lower. And, you know, Google, you're going to have to respond because this is going to be, this is going to get really tough. Um, and so I do think competition, again, is always a reality of business. And then one of the things that sort of like I, I really sort of um, almost instructively from, from Amazon um, learned or, or sort of took away was that um, the marriage of technology and operations uh, applied in sort of a, in a, in an innovative way and with sort of continuous improvement could actually become or is, is actually in and of itself a moat. And so if you think about Amazon as a business for a second, um, they have two businesses, two major businesses. One is um, uh, e-commerce and, and sort of being the everything store. And the other is AWS, where they sort of are this um, incredible cloud platform. And in both cases, you actually think about what their what their core mode is. And in both cases, the mode is actually, it's not pure technology. It's actually a combination of technology and operations. So in the, um, on the, uh, on the e-commerce and the everything store side, that like at this point, Amazon's number one moat is their logistics. It's the fact that, you know, I buy something off Amazon and I can get it in one or two days, which is absolutely incredible to be able to support, you know, millions and millions of products delivered to you within one to two days. That's an insurmountable value prop compared to anyone else. And if you think about what actually happens when you click, you know, the buy button, you know, it's it's actually this very operational and sort of like manually intensive process. Like somebody goes into a warehouse, figures out where one of the, you know, obviously a lot of this is like more automated now with robotics, but um, which I'm sure you know all about, but someone goes in the warehouse, finds the object, um, finds whatever object somebody wants to buy, puts them into a box, packages it up, mails it out, and then that this box gets, um, gets delivered. And um, Amazon now owns a bunch of the delivery process. And so when it gets delivered, it goes into a truck and then somebody takes it and somebody drives it, you know. It's just like, it's this very manual process with a lot of steps, but they've been able to apply technology to each of these steps successively and quite, quite obsessively over the course of decades to result in sort of this like insurmountable value prop. Um, the same thing is true on the cloud side. You know, in that case, it's more around DevOps. So how can you res- like deliver all these services that just massive scale with such high availability at low cost? And it's, it's the same thing just with, with DevOps instead of sort of physical operations. And so when I thought about labeling, you know, I didn't think about it as like, hey, it's true that it's operational. You know, humans are involved in the process of labeling. And so as a result, it's not this sort of like, it's not a pure tech problem or it's not a, sort of the, one of these clean problems. But I, you know, I always had a lot of conviction in the same way, you know, if you were able to marry technology and operations incredibly well, and you sort of take the process of, of getting a piece of data labeled and getting humans to check over it and, and verifying the quality, and you were to sort of scrunch that down or optimize each step with technology and, and, and our own algorithms and, and our own systems, then you would result in something that was like impossible to catch up with. And so that's really how we've thought about the business. And I think what's played out in reality, which is that, you know, like, like, as you mentioned back in 2016, 2017, um, there was a lot of competition. I remember we would go into, um, uh, sales pitch meetings and people would say, you know, I've gotten in the past month, I've gotten emails from 30 labeling companies. Um, and, <laughs> and so, so, so t- sort of tell me how you're different. And I think it, at first though, like maybe a little daunting, but over time we sort of proved that we proved exactly what I just mentioned. We could achieve higher quality, um, higher scale, um, you know, best pricing and, and, uh, and continue scaling in that way. One thing I've always been curious about, um, and maybe the information is available online, but since you're here, I'm just going to ask you, right. What's the role of learning models to accelerate the labeling process? The best, the best ways to think about this are to that, like, um, you know, I think, I think Tesla has some great presentations on this actually around how they build up their data engine and where they apply learning models in the process. You know, I think there's sort of like, um, our philosophy is really that like, you know, the output or the outcome that we want is really high quality data that matches as well as possible the data that you want your, the sort of like thing you want your model to predict. Um, there's a lot of sort of like judgments in that process that it might be easier for a human or a machine to make, assuming that they have like enough of a prior. That prior needs to be usually given by, you know, that prior might be hard for the machine to produce, but but the actual result might be easy for the human to produce. So one example is like in producing an outline of an object, um, 
Machines are actually pretty good at producing outlines of objects, but especially if you can give them a, a, like a tight bounding box around an object, they can produce that outline extremely well. Then if you ask a human instead to produce an outline of that object, that's pretty painstaking and, and takes a while. I mean, there's just a lot of clicks involved. And so a lot of the process of learning models is like, how can you reduce the problem to, how do you reduce one step that's very expensive for a human to do into two steps where the first step is efficient for the human to do and the second step is efficient for the machine to do or you know vice versa efficient for machine and then efficient for human but it's sort of like um p sifting to get like sifting through these sort of like complex and, and manually intensive and sort of like long tasks into uh this sort of like almost the sort of like eigenvectors of tasks or, or if you will or like what are sort of like the principal component tasks that that you can farm off some of them to humans some of them to machines and therefore generate um, really high quality data using you know dramatically less effort. That's that's sort of like one big part of it. And then the other big part of it is that um, humans actually make a lot of mistakes. Um, uh, that's that's sort of like a, a, a trait of humans is that we are we are not perfect. And um, quality so quality control becomes really really important in any sort of um, manually intensive process, whether that's manufacturing or software de de development or uh, or or um, data production. Um, and so a lot of it is how do you apply learning models to help catch when the humans are making mistakes and vice versa. So that ideally these sort of like errors that the humans and the machines are making are non-overlapping. Uh, yeah, non-overlapping so that we get overall much higher quality data. That's very interesting because even though in some sense you start out from labeling as or high quality data a lot of it initially labeling being the key thing to provide. And at first, it's in some sense the dirty work nobody wants to do. But soon enough, you realize that to do that work efficiently, you actually get to do machine learning in-house to partially automate, not fully automate, obviously, obviously, otherwise there's no real labeling involved, but partially automate that process. And in fact, you probably built some of the most advanced uh, models in-house, like large neural net models for vision language, as a way to aid the labelers, I imagine. Yeah, totally. And this was actually like, I mean, I think in the early days, we actually, it was hard to, um, you'll remember these days well, um, it was hard to hire um, the best machine learning engineers because, you know, they could work on our problem, which is a subset of the overall sort of like these like, um, these sexy AI problems, or they could go work at, let's say a self-driving car company um, and work on like, you know, arguably one of the sexier problem statements of our time. And, um, and so that was, it was one of the harder things, but I think as we showed, you know, as time went on and we sort of showed what the like actual problem set that we had was all of a sudden became a lot more attractive. And again, I think I hate to keep referring to Amazon, but, but I do think they're such an inspiring company in many ways because, you know, um, Amazon is probably the, like at this point, the largest scale, uh, applier of robotics to uh to many of their processes at least in definitely advanced robotics um and a lot of it is because they they focus on these like very operationally challenging problems and that gave them sort of like the playground um and the sort of sandbox in which all of these very interesting technical problems emerge and so this is maybe one of my one of my other learnings which is that um technical uh technical intrigue is is somewhat fractal fractal in the sense that like you know almost any problem you can find collapse, you know, sort of can expand into a suite of, of very interesting technical challenges. I, I love that observation. And also it really resonates. I feel like once you dive deep enough into something, you care enough about it, a lot of interesting things pop out. It, it's never as boring as you thought it was going to be. Sometimes you wish it stayed boring, but uh, it's always uh, immediately much more interesting. Now I'm curious. Um, you have many companies as customers. Uh, are there any companies that you think back to in the early days, like who were the initial ones that uh, you, know, you got on board? And are there any one that still remain today from those early customers? In the very early days, you know, um, a lot of our customers were uh, self, these, these same self-driving car companies. And it was sort of, again, it was because it was sort of the perfect storm of they, were, they had they had to build their own algorithms. Um, they uh, had huge amounts of data at that point, sort of like um, almost like in in um, 
unprecedented amounts of data because they sort of like, they have these cars going around collecting terabytes and terabytes of data and they've come back and they have to start doing machine learning on them. Um, and they had just um, these sort of, uh, these very ambitious goals and, and, and huge amounts of resources. And so those were, these were a lot of our, our early customers and many of them still remain, you know, we still work with the folks that, folks that like Neuro, for example, or a lot of the early startups uh, from the ecosystem. And um, they were the first ones, not Neuro specifically, but other self-driving car companies were the first ones to really take a chance on us because I think from their perspective, it was sort of like, what do we have to lose? You know, <laughs> we're in this, um, we got to build, we got to build self-driving cars. And this is like one of, you know, 50 problems that we have to solve. So we might as well um, work with a sort of like smart enterprising company to solve one of these 50 so we can focus on the other 49. And, um, and this was like the birth of, I think, a lot of the incredible tech that we were able to build and the birth of a lot of, um, a lot of the business up until, you know, even until, you know, 2018, 2019, this still was like the, the a lion's share of what we were doing was still related to autonomy, autonomous vehicles, self-driving cars in some capacity. And, um, and it was a, it was a very, you know, it was an incredible problem set because A, the sort of like the scale of data and the scale of challenges and sort of the, the like, that was where at the time, a lot of the sort of like most cutting edge techniques in machine learning were being applied. And so the opportunity to sort of like be close to and, and aligned with the cutting edge of technology, I think was like incredibly exciting. But then also we got to work with some of the most um, demanding uh, machine learning engineers um, that, that were out there. And, uh, and the, I guess another thing that I've learned, and I'm sure you've learned at Covariant is that working with demanding customers is one of these sort of, um, in the moment, quite unpleasant, but like in the long run, very rewarding processes where, you know, the, the demanding customers, they make your life, um, pretty unpleasant and, 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 uh, and sort of push you to do things that you probably wouldn't normally do. But then in the process, you get, you have the opportunity to sort of improve your product, improve your processes and really sort of. Um, out of all that pressure build sort of like these incredible, incredible things. Now, one thing that stuck with me for a long time for the self-driving car companies is catching up with Andre Karpathy a couple of years ago. Uh, he was still at Tesla at the time, heading up the autopilot and AI efforts there. He was saying um, essentially that majority of time has to be spent on effectively the labeling playbook, which is very interesting because, you know, people talk about, you know, self-driving car, maybe it's a sexier uh, application to work on. Turns out when you go there, uh, he tells you, actually, the real thing we need to be get, getting really right is the labeling playbook. And in fact, it's a book that's like 80, well, it's not a book literally, but it's, you know, it's 80 pages, 100 pages. And, you know, training the people who um, have to then execute upon what's in the book and have to flag when something in the book maybe isn't right, then we need to update it. Like that whole in some sense, operation, as you call it, is, is the thing that matters, which is so interesting because that's what you specialize in and have played it simply out across many industries. Yeah. I mean, I think it's sort of like, um, I do think of, of, of Andre um, as quite visionary in general. And I think that like one of the things that he sort of, you saw, he like wrote this short story I can't remember what exactly it was called. Just it was um it was along these lines, but it's sort of like I think the way that you know he really thought about the sort of like the labels and the data sets as like a compression of the human insights and intelligence and knowledge that you were trying to like um, you know simulate and emulate and learn from your model. And so and so therefore these like the like lo you know what are the lossy steps here? Lossy step one is like what is your what is your labeling guidelines um, or your labeling playbook as you mentioned. Lossy step two is like, how do people perform against that, against that labeling, um, against that playbook? And then once you have all your labels, lossy step three is, is the model and the sort of like, you know, the neural network and the architecture of the parameters and, and all that stuff and, and how that predicts against, uh, against your problem. And so it's actually really, I think that one of the like visionary things that Andre really did was that he, he, he focused on, you know, there were so, you know, I don't think any, any one of these three is like intrinsically less important than the others, but, uh, but there were so many people focused on the last step. There were a lot of people focused on train on building the best neural network architectures and training those up and building them up. Um, and so the first two lossy steps, there were sort of met much fewer people focused on, and that was really where maybe there's more alpha and more competitive advantage to be, to be squeezed out of the situation. 
Yeah, it's it's very interesting when when in some sense somebody dives so deep into the problem and then comes back out with insights that everybody else kind of instantly agrees, but wasn't necessarily thinking that way um, ahead of time. Now, uh, a little while ago, I saw you at the Fortune Brainstorm AI event in San Francisco, and you emphasized the importance of artificial intelligence for the military, a topic, in fact, many tech folks like to avoid. How do you see AI play a role for the military, and why do you like double clicking on that topic rather than like many others who are evading that topic most of the time. Totally. Um, so I guess to maybe to start on this, I'll give a little bit of my own background. So I, I, um, I grew up in Los Alamos, New Mexico, which is, uh, where the atomic bomb was first built. The Manhattan project was sort of housed there. And so in the forties, you know, they, you know, hundreds of the most brilliant scientists in the world, physicists and engineers, um, sort of convened and and solve the sort of series of real technical hurdles to ultimately build the atomic bomb, which was this piece of technology that I think, um, thankfully we haven't had that too many of them detonated, um, uh, in, in the past, you know, 70, 80 years. Um, but, uh, has been a really, you know, sort of like monumental technology for how much of the world and geopolitics and all that stuff has sort of played out. And when you grow up there, Every year you sort of relearn the story of, of the Manhattan projects to like get an appreciation of where you're from, but also you know, it's, it's this incredible story. It's really crazy in, in a lot of ways. And, uh, and, and there's actually soon to be a Christopher Nolan movie about Oppenheimer and about this, <laughs> this set of circumstances. But so I grew up in this environment. Both my parents, um, are physicists. They worked at the national lab. They worked on national security problems. And so, um, I, unlike most people, uh, that I've seen in, in sort of like the tech ecosystem in the Bay area, um, I always sort of, uh, was pretty deeply ingrained in the sort of like marriage between technology and national security. And, um, and so, you know, as the sort of like events of the past few years have been playing out and, you know, maybe the most, uh, landmark moment was, uh, sort of like the Google project Maven, um, sort of like kind of scandal, so to speak, when, when Google sort of refused to work with the U S military, um, due to, you know, activism from, from employees within, within Google, um, it really, um, a, it really made me uncomfortable and sort of, I think it, it, uh, part of the reason why it caused me to, you know, honestly focus even more on national security is I think that we, we kind of don't have a choice. I think that one of the maybe differences in how I think about it versus versus how a lot of other people think about it is I think the way that, um, the way that I've heard a lot of technologists think about it is, um, Hey, we're building this small technology. We can all agree this technology would be, it'd be better off for the world if we never used AI for, you know, autonomous weapons or, um, or some of these sort of like violent applications of the technology. So we're not, so we're not going to be focused on building, which I think is, you know, I can, I can really appreciate that train of thinking. But the issue is that um, this is a coordination problem. It's like fundamentally like a, a you know a tragedy of the commons or or prisoner's dilemma or whatever or you know your whatever favorite framing you have is, which is that we can have that belief, but then there's going to be bad guys in some other part of the world or some other part of the um, um, you know somewhere else in one of these other countries who are not going to have those uh, those principles and are going to very willingly apply it to um, sort of you know national security applications, autonomous weapons or, or, or the like. And I think you saw this play out in practice over the past few years where there's, there's a whole Chinese cottage industry around facial recognition. So AI applied to facial recognition for, you know, national surveillance in China and Uyghur detection for the suppression of, you know, that, that racial minority, um, within China. And so I think it's sort of like, it's very clear to me that we're going to see bad guys, um, uh, around the world utilize AI for, uh, for autonomous weapons. I think there was even, there was an example, I think in Israel of sort of an autonomous turret that was used, um, uh, or Israeli tech, I believe an autonomous turret that, you know, whenever some, you know, any, anything or anyone entered like this, like a particular bounding box in the, in the sort of video, it would sort of be shot and, um, and killed. And so, okay. So now, so assume that that's like a belief that you have that we're in a world where 
these things are going to be built. So, so people are going to build these things. Then, um, then you get into, I think the sort of like the fundamental question, which is like, okay, do you, do we believe that America, do we th believe if someone's going to build them, to, it's important for America to have them. And I think that, you know, a little bit of, of sort of world history and I'll sort of like, um, I'll, uh, you know, people can certainly argue about this, but I do think that the sort of era of relative peace that we've had since World War II is, is pretty incredible. If you think about like human history pre-World War II, it's, it's punctuated by war and really like littered with war. And in the past, you know, 80 years have been, um, surprisingly, uh, peaceful at Pax Americana, I think is what, what it's like often called. And I think a huge part of that is because America has been the clear superpower of the world. We've really led, and this is through a combination of military dominance, technological dominance, economic dominance, you know, all of these factors together. And I think we risk falling into an era of a lot of chaos if at any point America doesn't, doesn't lead on these dimensions. And so, um, and then I think maybe the last thesis here is that I think that the, that whatever country utilizes AI most effectively in, in their national security for defense, intelligence, et cetera, is going to be militarily dominant. I think that, you know, it, it's, it's really, it's not hard to imagine the, the scenarios in which autonomous weapons or, or fleets of fleets of autonomous weapons could massively outcompete and sort of outmaneuver, um, a human coordinated, a human coordinated, uh, warfighting force. And we're seeing a lot of that, you know, the glimpses of that play out in the war in Ukraine of Ukraine versus Russia. And I think that that trend is only something that accelerates. So I don't come talk a lot, but like, um, but that's, that's really the core of why I believe what you know, what I do and why I think it's important to work on these things. And I think, I think it is everyone's right to sort of like choose whether or not this is a mission that they want to get on board with. But I would, I would sort of, um, I would encourage people to think about the sort of like broader game theory, uh, rather than just sort of the question of, do I believe this technology should be applied to this problem? Right. I mean, it, it's very complex. I think the game theoretic formulation gives a very different perspective than the just immediate reaction to the specific technology and what it might be capable of. Um, it, it's a much bigger picture way of, of, of thinking about it. Now, not sure if you can comment on this, but are there any kind of things you've done with the government, with the military that you can say something about um, that are interesting from an AI perspective? Yeah, well, I think one of them, one of the big problems is, is just around, um, you know, it's all around geospatial intelligence or, or satellite satellite image recognition. And this is, I think, one of the, the first use cases that the government really sort of applying, which is that, you know, there's a huge amount of satellite data, satellite imagery data that's collected at any moment um, from from all those sort of like satellites orbiting the Earth. Um, they're costly imaging, imaging the Earth. And um, a lot of these images are really high def. You know, I think a lot of people have used Google Maps or Google Earth and sort of have seen the sort of like quality of <laughs> satellite images, imaging. And um, I think one of the craziest things that I learned about before, um, before really sort of like thinking about this problem is that um, the government collects a huge amount of satellite imagery and then really um, is quite bottlenecked in the analysis of this imagery. You know, most of the images go totally unseen by any human and without, you know, any sort of deep learning methods, it's very hard to actually, if, you, if a human doesn't look at an image, then there's not that much value that you get out of the image. And so um, if, you thought, if you think about it, it's like there could be all sorts of bad or relevant or sort of like interesting stuff going around or on in the world that we just don't process because, you know, we don't have the right, we don't have the right um, automated techniques. So one of the examples that we deployed was um, in the war in Ukraine, we built these algorithms that, that in all the major cities could detect um, the level of damage associated with um, basically the, on a building by building level associated with the war so that in a somewhat real-time basis, you could basically assess like, oh, there's a lot of damage in that neighborhood or in that, that corridor or that area. Let's coordinate a humanitarian response, but also potentially coordinate a, a conflict response. And, um, and this was a technology that, you know, I think for most people, machine learning sounds pretty direct and, and, you know, doesn't sound too complicated, but has immense benefit and impact in the actual sort of like application and, and rollout and pr productionization of the technology. So that's one example. I mean, I think there's all sorts of other examples 
in the, you know, in applying it to different kinds of data that the, the government has access to and applying it to a lot of the really manual processes too that the government uses. I think what, another thing that I like to point out to people oftentimes is that um, the government has a huge amount of, of really manual processes that don't need to be manual. Um, and, uh, and, and those are the kinds of things that I think maybe frustrate citizens or slow us down or, or, you know, um, and, and a lot of those sort of like legacy problems. But I think that part of that is like, it's been hard for the government to, to keep a pace with just like sort of the, the ways in which the world has been scaling, um, which are, which are quite complex and unique. And so there's all sorts of really boring processes that, you know, you think about like Medicare and Medicaid, or you think about, um, you know, a lot of, uh, health and human services, you know, there's just a lot of things that are sort of, um, antiquated that, that need to be revamped. Um, and, uh, and we're trying to build algorithms sort of help with all this. The exciting thing is this is becoming possible. And that brings me to our Shida. The next topic I want to, want to discuss with you, which is we've gone from an era of AI that's been amazing and surprisingly good at what it was doing, which was essentially building a large neural network specific to the one task you want to solve and just collect a ton of data for that one task to a new era where um, very large models are trained on a very wide variety of data, um, often called foundation models and language-based uh, large language models um, that somehow have the ability to be good at everything somehow and even be good at niches um, very often, even though they're trained in a much more general way. And I'm curious how that shift in AI, how you see that kind of just from a pure AI evolution perspective, but also how does that affect the scale business of providing data that might often be more specific in the past to specific applications? You know, you have to acknowledge how just amazing what's happened is in the sense of like, both the sort of like, I think the paradigm shift that you're describing in terms of, you know, the shift towards foundation models, but also just like the, you know, the foundation models themselves are capable of so much more than um, many people imagine. I think it's really like, I think it's been impressive and surprising to me um, having sort of like been an observer um, of the field and sort of been been in the field. I think the sort of like the things that we can now see and, and are capable of, these foundation models are capable of is like, it's totally shocking. You know, I think one of my sort of like litmus tests for this has been, I think for a long time, you know, let's call it, um, let's call it, uh, 2016 to 2020, uh, to 2020. Um, a lot of times people who didn't, who weren't super in the field would ask, you'd ask you a question was like, can AI do insert blank? Right. Or like, you like, can I use AI to uh, do, and then whatever is in the blank. And then well, most of the time the answer would be like, oh no, not really. Like it's pretty limited technology. Like, you know, um, uh, but it can do maybe like some very small set of that problem. And then now you look at it and, um, and you look at these sort of like large language models and chat GPT like systems, et cetera. And all of a sudden the answer to a lot of those questions is actually kind of like, you know, it's like, yes, but it's not very reliable, um, rather than just like a flat out no, which is pretty, um, which is pretty insane. And I, you know, personally, I think that this sort of like last mile of reliability is going to be incredibly difficult to, 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 um, to, to tackle. And I don't, you know, I don't know, I may be more skeptical of our ability to tackle that as a community as a whole, but the, um, it's been a very, it's been a whole shift from a, from an ecosystem perspective. And I think it's created, um, I think it's wrapped, it's dramatically reduced the barriers of entry of being able to use AI. And so that, that I think is one of the exciting things is all of a sudden for so many problems, you can now, you can now build solutions or build products to solve some of those problems with, without requiring, um, all of the sort of like pain and hurdles that you needed before, which, um, I think on the whole mean just like a massive growth to the AI industry. And I think has been one of the main, certainly one of my main sort of like concerns with the industry, which is like, Hey, if it used to be that you needed a hundred million dollars to do AI effectively in any way, then like, how the heck are we ever going to, how many people have a hundred million dollars to spend? Um, but now that, now that you don't, I think it's sort of like this incredible, um, you know, it, it, this, the true democratization moment of AI, but I'm actually curious to hear your perspective. Obviously you, um, 
you think about this stuff as well and you've sort of seen the same transition happen. Well, I've seen it happen on multiple fronts and kind of the most intriguing thing to me from a covariant perspective where we build the AI for robotic automation, pick and place type operations in warehouses is that it's, it's one of those things where maybe five years ago, definitely 10 years ago, people would have said, you should build a specialized model for grocery picking versus a model for apparel picking versus a model for yet, you know, electrical supplies picking. And it turns out that building a single model for all of them is better for every single one of them. It's, it's this funny thing where specialization doesn't help you. It's the opposite. It's by training on everything that you get a, a level of generalization. I think that's what you're alluding to is that these models have a level of generalization that's different from what was possible before and allows you to kind of get to much higher levels of reliability because generalization is a lot better than it used to be. And so training this very large model on literally all types of objects to then go pick just groceries or go pick just apparel has been, to me, very interesting. It's been something we've been doing for a while. But to us, big part is we, we didn't realize how much it was part of a big trend until it also started happening in language. And we're like, wait, this is actually very general. This is something that is the new wave of AI is that you should probably in general train in a very general way. Now, I think one of the big differences, and I'm, I imagine this will affect what scale does a lot, is I think in the language space, one of the big challenges today is that the models just generate statistically plausible patterns of text. Yep. Um, that's the default. And that's not usually what humans want. Sometimes, sure, if you want to be entertained, it's pretty much ideal. Um, but if you want to get truthful writing done or truthfully investigate something, this, this disconnect between statistically plausible and truthful is a very big one. And it kind of spit an open ended question, but I'm kind of curious the role scale could play in somehow. What's the new kind of annotation that will inject a notion of truthfulness into these models? Totally. Yeah. And I think that the, the, um, you know, if you, if I go back to, um, some of, uh, you know, when you ask, how do you actually automate, how do you apply technology to the labeling process? I think the, the, the key thing is that, and this is what I sort of like my general philosophy is that you want to invest the human effort towards the parts that you know, humans are especially good at and try to decompose the problem into, into these pieces where, you know, machines can do what the machines are great at, but the humans can do what the, mach the humans are great at. And I think in the era of large language models, we're seeing that same paradigm play out just in a slightly different, you know, form where now all of a sudden the things that you really need the humans to do are kind of exactly what you're saying, which is like, you know, how do you make sure the model uh, responds in like a useful way? How do you make sure the model responds Truthfully, how do you make sure the model, um, you know, actually cites proper evidence or uses proper evidence? How do you make sure the model, um, you know, uh, it res like gives, understands the question in a way that isn't just sort of like, you know, isn't in line with like what would what would be out on the internet, but is in line with sort of like how human might converse with with another human or whatnot. And so all these sort of like, um, all these dimensions in which I think people have. You know, I think one of the, one of the cool things that's happened in the past six months is that GPT-3 has been out since 2020, right? Like it's, 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 it's been out there, but then it was chat GPT and the sort of like that form factor and that model that all of a sudden really, um, blew it up, at least in the eyes of sort of like the, the average consumer and, um, and the, you know, the, the common understanding is that the biggest difference between um, chat GPT and, and GPT-3 was the application, you know, there are a few differences, but the biggest one was the application of reinforcement learning with human feedback um, and sort of uh, doing exactly what we're talking about, where you have human experts look at, you know, what are all the ways in which the model could finish the sentence or finish the, or respond to a query and have them, have the human sort of say, that's actually the best one because of X, Y, and Z reason, or like because of, um, because of this. And, um, and, uh, and it was through a lot of that, you know, to the tunes of like tens of millions of dollars of that, <laughs> that 
um, that the model actually become dramatically more useful. And even, you know, it was actually really shocking to me, but even, um, I was talking to a journalist the other day who was sort of like, um, they were describing this process in sort of the, the layman's terms, the, in, in layman's terms, and the way they sort of articulate it was like, hey, it's almost like GPT-3 was a genius, but it was sort of like, you know, it was impossible to communicate with. And then all you through using RLHF, you sort of like, you know, taught it how to communicate um, in a way that was actually useful to people. And I don't know if that's the perfect analogy. It's, it's certainly, um, yeah, but it's like a relevant analogy. It's a way to think about it, which is like, hey, all of a sudden, um, the ways in which you, uh, the ways in which you apply human insight is to make, is to make the models more useful, which is, I think, in line with the annotation on the whole, but is maybe moving more towards the concept of, you know, the broader concept of alignment, which is, you know, now that you have these powerful AI systems, how do you align them with human intents and what humans want, rather than sort of, um, rather than being isolated in some way from the, from the sort of like, um, from what humans care about. So, so that's one way I think about it. But then, and then this trend of RLHF, reinforcement learning with human feedback, we've seen is just a, is, is, um, is like a very big and growing part of our business. It turns out that, um, you know, uh, at least right now, it looks like this is the main way in which people think about building really, really incredible high performing models. And so it's become a, a really big part of, of what we're, what we're, what we're providing to a lot of these AI companies. And, and I think it's a great paradigm. It's a, it's a, it's a pretty efficient paradigm for getting the models to improve. Um, and it's one which really, um, utilizes and emphasizes what humans are really good at. So I'm excited about it. Just to maybe make sure I fully understand it. In your case, do you see the, would somebody provide to scale, let's say a large language model that they are reasonably happy with, and then you would run reinforced learning with human feedback, meaning it would just generate things and humans would rank. And that's the new effort the humans do, ranking responses and so forth to, to then improve that model. Um, now, what I'm curious about is wh when you run this, right, different humans will have different responses, what they like, what they don't like. Um, and of course, we have some extremes in the ecosystem where it's not so much humans feedback, but where there is things trained on specific humans, sound like Elon Musk, sound like this person, that person. It, it just seems like this human feedback is a pretty big open question there. Um, in some sense, what your customer would want it to be, what, what type of feedback they would want. Seems like a whole other playbook to be built there, possibly customer specific. Yeah, no, I actually think this is like the, to your point around when, when, um, Andre talked about how, uh, a big part of, of the work in autonomous vehicles or, or building an autonomous vehicle at Tesla was the, uh, with the labeling guidelines. I actually think this is that kind of on steroids, which is that, you know, and this is, this gets to more philosophical things, but I think over time, what's going to differentiate these LOMs is, is, you know, in part, you know, who is able to apply more compute to it or who has slightly better techniques or who has like slightly better set of tokens upon which they, they trained upon. But, um, those things are, are very hard to have a sort of like, you know, real decisive edge on relative to anyone else. And so a lot of the, I think th then you get to this like new phase, which is much more nuanced, which is like, what are your, what are your subtle design decisions that you, that you build into the model and where those design decisions get made? I think is at the step of like, how are you defining the RLHF guidelines? How are you, how are you defining the sort of like how you want these human rankings to be produced? And, um, and I think this is pretty akin to, you know, almost like interface design for, for a, a, a UI, right? It's like, okay, this is where you're sort of like, this is where you're deciding if somebody asks a, you know, a purely informational question, what should the response kind of be like? Or if somebody asks a more opinion-based question, how do you want the model to respond? Or someone asks um, something that is about coding, what's, you know, what's the right structure and format? You know, it's actually, all of these are sort of subjective decisions, um, or many of them are subjective decisions. And this sort of like design paradigm is how you build out the RLHF principles. And so, um, so I think it's, I think it's really important. And then, and then, you know, to the, to your, to the point before and around like, what are the lossy steps? You know, lossy step number one is 
okay, how do you distill what you actually want into the set of guidelines? Lossy step number two is, um, you know, how do you, uh, how do you make sure that people are actually, how are people performing against that? How are labelers performing against that set of guidelines? And then lossy step three is sort of the magic of the models. You know, how does the model actually grok this and then, and then kind of, um, uh, make sense of it all. And so, um, and so under this paradigm, I think it's sort of like, it's, it's, it's really, really important. And it's sort of the, you know, it's, it's undeniably really important. It's, it's very intriguing to me personally, as a reinforcement learning researcher, how, you know, reinforcement learning went from this thing that as this promising thing, always, you know, it'll, it'll be critical in the future, but it's maybe not all the way there yet. It's not being made part of products yet, short of, you know, contextual bandits for, for, um, advertising and recommendations. So all of a sudden, it's this thing that seemingly makes the difference between, as you said, GPT-3 that's been around for almost three years to chat GPT coming out a few months ago, being essentially the same, but, but that subtle difference of that component and completely taking off and taking the whole world by storm, not just AI researchers being interested, but everybody being interested. It's, it's, so, uh, it, it's really intriguing to see that play out. Um, uh, and I actually think another cool part of this has been that, um, you know, the, uh, th this is like one of these, these funny things. I mean, this, like the instruct GPT paradigm or, or in general, sort of like this reinforcement learning, learning with human feedback has been something that OpenAI has been working on since, um, since 20, 2019, I think was probably the first paper, maybe 2018 was the first paper that they published with this sort of like idea. And so. It's really not actually a new idea at all either. It's been this idea that's been out there for a while. And I think that the, maybe one of the insights of, of, of ChatGPT was like, okay, you applied in huge measure and all of a sudden you get like this crazy new performance. I think it's maybe one of the kind of exciting things about machine learning and AI and research is that you can, it's probably the application of old existing ideas that actually when applied in great measure actually are going to result in like incredible, uh, incredible outcomes. Yeah, that's a very good point. I remember the first, uh, RL with human feedback paper from OpenAI, um, was actually even earlier, I think maybe even 2017 or 2016, and it was to teach a robot to backflip. And the reason was because normally when you want to do reinforced learning with robots, the typical paradigm would be you write some piece of code that is the reward function. And then it tries to optimize that reward that's equivalent to the score in the game. But for a backflip, how, how do you write a piece of code that says, this was the quality of the backflip? It's like, it's not clear how you, how you do that part. So you don't have a scoring mechanism. Instead, humans would watch two backflips and say which one, or attempts really early on, because the agent doesn't know how to do it yet, say which one of the two is a better attempt. And over time, it would actually learn the reward function, which is also what's happening, of course, now with, with these language models, learning the reward function to be optimized because it's hard to specify by hand, which it, it's so intriguing how RL kind of in that way, which many people I think at the time saw as like a very specific version of RL with human feedback, much more tedious, um, but it's actually the one that, that makes its way into the most prevalent application today. As, as you'll acknowledge, like pathing in AI, I think is always really funny and, and kind of like, uh, you know, it's, it, it, uh, it never exactly matches sort of, uh, sort of what you think is going to happen. And so even the emergence of language models, I think was sort of like, I think there were sort of like two reactions, you know, I think I, when GPT-3 came out that a lot of people had, or even GPT-2 came out, but it was sort of like, you know, the reactions were, oh, this is like wow, this is like really something or, or like a lot of reactions are like, oh yeah, it's cool. But you know, it's, you know, this, this, and this, and this are always going to be limitations or like, it doesn't demonstrate like real reasoning or, you know, whatever it might be. And I think the sort of like, one of the coolest things that the AI community has shown is that, um, I think it's really surprising, honestly, that as you just keep scaling it up, a lot of those criticisms like slowly, <laughs> slowly, um, uh, go away. And so, you know, it is it is this crazy thing where it's like, we're at this point where we have this sort of like paradigm that, you know, we keep scaling it. We see crazy new things. Who knows what happens if we keep scaling it forever. Talking about crazy new things. Um, recently I saw you have someone at scale with a job title called advanced prompt engineer, uh, or at least that's how they advertise themselves. 
Uh, people have been joking about this, right? Uh, this prompt engineering as a new job, but sounds like this is a real, real thing now. Uh, prompting as a job. Yeah. No, I think that um, you know one of the one of the illustrations of this that I that that um, that I thought was like really interesting was that if you um, if you went to uh, if if uh, this was like on Twitter recently, but there was people who figured out how to like jailbreak out of the GPT chat or sorry, not GPT, uh, Bing chat. Um, they figured out how to get the Bing chat to reveal the entire prompt that's used to sort of like, um, to sort of like set up that chat. And, um, the prompt that sets this up is, is, uh, it's quite long, quite detailed. And there's a lot of like different nuances to it. And I sort of imagine the sort of like the Bing team, the Microsoft team before they launched, uh, Bing chat was sort of like a B testing different prompts versus one another and trying to figure out which one was sort of like, what are the right sentences to include in the prompt and whatnot. But I really think that is the paradigm in many ways of the future. I think that's sort of like one way to think about these LLMs is that they're in many ways like a new computer and, um, and figuring out the right ways to sort of program this computer, this sort of like cognitive computer um, in ways that actually produce what you want and, and sort of like get it, engineer the right outcomes from it is going to be, um, is giving a new way of, um, a new way of programming or certainly like this like new frontier of how to get machines to do what we want. You know, I think another, um, I think one of the, this, this, uh, this prompt engineer that's on our staff that you referenced, uh, his name is, um, Riley, Riley Goodside. And I remember when he showed me some of the sort of like prompts that he built and, and, you know, some of them were like, he would sort of like coax the model into the exact kind of reasoning or the exact kind of sort of like train of thought that he wanted to make sure the model had before doing some like very complex sort of analysis or, or he would, you know, there's one, this was actually maybe the most incredible where he sort of, um, taught the model how to, when it didn't know the answer, ask the Python shell for like, you know, for the, you know, these models aren't good at doing arithmetic, for example. So when the model doesn't know what it wants to do, teach it how to use the Python shell to be able to, to ask for an answer. And these are, I think, are, are crazy illustrations of like how, how you can sort of like use this new computer in sort of like interesting ways. And, um, I don't see that going away. I think that like, we're going to need to, you know, need to know how to use these, these new computers just in the same way that, you know, there's coding, which is, which is the art of making computers do stuff well. And then there's also sort of like, um, there's all these arts around getting humans to do what you want to do. You know, management is an art or, um, or, uh, you know, sales is an art or, or marketing is an art, you know, you know, so I think that, um, I think it's maybe somewhere in between these of sort of like somewhere in between management and coding, but, um, but there is, is sort of like a, um, a study around how to get, uh, these models to sort of do what you want. And I think it's sort of a, um, I don't know, it's, it's one of the exciting fields of human knowledge that I think has yet to be explored. So, and is highly valuable, you know, Bing chat, you know, that's a valuable thing that's produced. It's very interesting that the prompt that you, you give it affects so much the behavior. Of course, it makes sense. The example you brought up is very interesting to me because it sounds like a whole new kind of security research area where, you know, which prompts are such that they're also secure against being revealed. Because if you spend so much time engineering this really good prompt, um, if somebody chats with your bot and then the bot just reveals it, then, and then you, you lost your advantage maybe. So it seems like there's a lot of interesting things that will play out in that space. Yeah, no, I think it's, uh, I think that the, there's so many security, um, I don't know if the word is flaws, but sort of like, uh, uh, implications of these large language models that I think that's going to be one of the bigger you know, I think everyone's trying to grapple with it, but it's one of the bigger things that we have to think through as we roll out the technology is like, how do we do so in a way that, um, you know, if you think about, you know, if we go back to the thing about the government example, right? Um, we really, you really don't want your adversary knowing about any of the vulnerabilities of your model. Um, the issue is all of these models that are out in the open, they all have huge amounts of vulnerabilities and it doesn't take you very long to find the vulnerabilities that they have. And so, it requires sort of this, this like secretive paradigm where I think we're going to all have to, you know, build models in secret that, that, um, that other people don't have access to, and therefore they can't identify the vulnerabilities. 
but then they're still sort of pretty fragile or sort of um, pretty uh, pretty vulnerable. So it's sort of a, you know, I don't know if you, re- I'm sure you remember this, but like there was an era where adversarial examples were was sort of like the hot thing in AI research, and there was sort of this example of like a sticker you could put on uh, on anything, and all of a sudden the like an image classifier would would think it was a turtle or a god or whatever it was. Um, but that that kind of thing is like you know just an illustration of again how fragile the models are and and so therefore it creates all these risks going from the models to the impact they'll have right um in one of your recent talks actually the title of your talk was applying artificial intelligence to redefine every industry um of course that's a lot to cover so are there maybe some industries that you see in the next few years uh will really see a big revolution uh, thanks to AI. One of the analogies I like to use with folks, especially folks outside of the world of AI, is I think um, what people see, which is ChatGPT and Stable Diffusion and um, and maybe the Music LM and Bard and stuff like that, that really is just like kind of the tip of the iceberg of um, of AI, uh, of sort of AI impact. And a lot of the, the sort of like real impact is going to be under the surface and it's in sort of like bleeding and then flowing through all of these sort of like major industries and sort of driving just like very meaningful um, economic and sort of like uh, an, an automation of value sort of throughout the biggest industries in the, industries in the world. A few that I'll reference um, that I think might be the fastest to change. I think that advertising um, is going to fundamentally shift where we're going to move towards a world of fully automated advertising. Um, today, um, you know, if you think about how advertise, advertising is done, there's actually a very small number of ads that are out there. Ads in this form of like, you know, what's the actual content that is in the ad? And, um, and companies spend billions and billions of dollars of producing and sort of distributing and, and showing people this content. But fundamentally, that's, you know, it's a pretty unba- imbalanced equation. You know, we, we, there's so much user generated content out there, but there's still so few ads. Um, so I think that we're going to see this sort of like arms race of brands and companies, um, moving to build, you know, millions and millions of variations of their ads using generative AI and then assessing them independently and seeing, okay, what is going to be, um, what's going to perform the best. And so the way this is going to play out for each of us is we're going to get ads that, you know, seem highly more personalized, um, or potentially more creepy. And are sort of like much better tuned to be the exact thing that is going to get me to click and sort of like um, and 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 drive a purchase. So that that I think is one area that changes pretty dramatically. Um, another that I think we always talk about, but I hope I hope I'm right about is uh, is healthcare, um, both in the sort of like service of healthcare as well as uh, as well as health insurance. Um, health insurance, for what it's worth, is this massive massive industry, trillions and trillions of dollars to spend, but is ridiculously inefficient and very, very manual in how fundamentally, you know, it behaves. So that's a clear area where chat should be like systems or general large language models can produce huge amounts of automation to actually drive improvement there. But then, um, in addition to that, so is, um, so is, uh, so is healthcare itself, you know, globally speaking, there's a massive shortage of doctors, um, you know, most individuals, most people when they most care people who get care even in developed countries, they can only really afford one opinion, even though the sort of like consistency of doctors, you know, diagnoses or responses is quite variable. So so we're in this sort of like very constrained world of of how healthcare is delivered, where because we're constrained to one opinion from one doctor and there's not enough doctors, um, you know, that we have a lot of suboptimal outcomes. Whereas I think we're going to get into a world where like this analogy I just mentioned, mach- humans are going to do what humans are good at, machines are going to do what machines are good at, and you're going to get dramatically better medical diagnoses globally. So um, those are some examples. I think we talked about defense and, and national security. That I think is another really huge example. And I think the sort of like, you know, you can keep going, but the examples are everywhere. This is really exciting to, to kind of hear your vision of the future of AI and the impact we'll have on all our lives, especially with, through things like healthcare. Um, if you have the time, I'd like to ask you um, one last question, which is you're very busy. Um, what do you do to take your head 
off of things and to relax. This has changed, uh, through the years. I think that, uh, that, um, one of the newer hobbies that I've liked a lot is, is hiking, which, um, I didn't used to like very much. I didn't used to like physical activity too much, but, uh, you, you sort of, you learn to love the sort of like meditation, um, and the, the sort of, yeah, meditative component of it, which I, which I really appreciate. Um, and then I, I love, uh, I love consuming content of various forms. So whether that's reading or watching TV or watching movies, um, I think it's sort of like one of the great joys of, of, hu- of life is that you can sort of like experience these stories that are, that are like really built to, to, to sort of like elicit these like interesting responses out of you. And, um, and then I, I and I love history, um, and which I think is, is common among a lot of people that I know, but I think that's sort of like the, one of the like most interesting sort of like conundrums of, of humanity is that like on some, comp- on some level, humans haven't changed that much. And so sort of like, you know, um, human tendencies haven't changed that much and how humans behave is not too fundamentally different from, from that of, you know, um, thousands and thousands of years ago. At the same time, uh, our world has changed so dramatically. Society has changed dramatically. The technology we use has changed dramatically. Um, how we relate to one another has changed dramatically. And so there's sort of this like dual component where on the one hand, you know, maybe some people think that human nature is extremely predictable. And if you study enough history, you know exactly what's going to happen. On the other hand, we're in unprecedented times with unprecedented technologies like AI. And so it's like impossible to know what exactly is going to happen. And so I think that, you know, studying history is one of these, like, it's almost these great puzzles, which is like, you know, are there actual scalable lessons that you can learn across human history or are we sort of like always barreling into, into the unknown? And, um, and I find that super interesting and, and therefore love learning about, you know, uh, about what humans have done in the past. That really resonates. And I'll, I'll say a big reason why I enjoy hosting the podcast is because I think it's so interesting to hear the backstories behind the people who do the innovations in AI and to see actually there's quite a wide range of, of backstories and motivations and paths to get where they are today and see what, you know, hopefully other people can learn and be inspired from it. And definitely your story, Alex, is, is a really amazing one. I um, really appreciate you making the time to share that and also to share your vision for the future of AI. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Peter. It was a lot of fun.